Get started. My name is Steve Mallard. I teach at the uh, Tennessee College of Applied Technology in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Yeah, you do. Oh, okay. All right, anyway, um, I've been teaching for about 17 years, and I want to uh, talk about education, and, and uh, I'll get a little fired up in just a minute. Uh, I can speak without my PowerPoint, but it's going to take just a few minutes. We're trying to get it up. Um, our program uh, recently was invited to uh, Washington, D.C. to go to the White House. We actually won uh, number one in the world on uh, Tech Target. Most people don't know that. We actually beat out uh, MIT in innovation uh, with our learning management system in 2011. We were named a Computer World Laureate. And uh, this tiny little vocational school that came about about 50 years ago, most people think dumb kids go there. And uh, it's kind of funny because the average kid that leaves there leaves between $17 and $25 an hour. Now that's pretty good for kids that are 19 to 21 years of age. But anyway, um, we're gonna see if Ben can get this up real quick. It'll take just a second. If it works, it works. If it don't, I'll just wing it. Are we good? Are you uploading? Come on, Ben. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, we're gonna be all right. The jury's still out. All right, let me, uh, let me ask you guys real quick while we're waiting. How many of you guys would consider yourself, and I want you to be honest, and don't be embarrassed by looking around other people, would you think that you're a computer expert in your own way? In your own way. And don't be modest. And here's the biggest thing, you go to Freaknik or you go to Black Hat or uh, a lot of the other places that I attend and uh, no one ever considers yourself an expert because the uh, computers are so diverse today that you've got everything that's out there. So as an educator uh, in uh, 1999, whenever I first started at the school, they were saying, you know, what are you going to teach? We're going to teach A+, plus, how to make computers, how to load windows, and it was very, very basic. And then if you look at the progression that we've had over the last uh, 15 years, the biggest thing is now how do you teach computers? Well, the biggest thing is, is a lot of people say you get a four-year degree. How many of you guys have a computer science degree? Anybody? Okay. And, you know, here's the thing. When you look at degrees today, what you're actually looking at is how much did I train myself and how much did they train me? And Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs actually supports technical education. Now, I'm not, I'm not in here to knock universities or community colleges or what have you. What's happening in information technology today is we are not seeing the value behind IT people in what they've learned on their own. If you begin to talk about the programming languages that are out there, if you say PHP, ASP, it's okay, I can go with the cutoff thing. I know what's up here, they don't, they don't care. <laughs> and uh, here we go, guys. Let's go back real quick. It's it's, it's yeah, the resolution is. Is it the resolution? That's a technical hack. There we go. Technical hack. Somebody's going to be chopped off. All right. Just to back up a little bit, these are some of the awards that we've uh, won over the years. And, and is our school teaching the right way? No. <laughs> Our universities and community colleges teaching the right way. They are not. Some of them are like MIT, Caltech. Uh, there was a guy named Michael in here. The guy before him was uh, from Georgia Tech. And I think they're teaching a better way uh, to learn computer science. And I'm going to explain that. When we go forward, computer history isn't important. You know, whenever you walk into a, a computer science class, they start talking about computer history and what happened in 1960, 1970, 1980, and the next thing you know, you feel like you're in a history class. All you can wait for is the labs and the hands-on. Most people are going to be hands-on learners anyway. So, you know, what do, we, what do we need to teach? We need to uh, focus on lecture and what is happening in uh, industry. What do we need to be producing? Sys uh, system administrators, programmers, database folks, the whole nine yards. And we need to focus on hands-on. I'm going to tell you about an adventure that I had with the Tennessee Board of Regents when I'm talking to my boss and his fears of facing those folks. You know, I went, I went to him and I said, I want the freshman students to be put in with the senior students. And the reason I want this to take place is the senior students can educate the freshman students. And when they do this, it's going to produce a round robin effect where they see everything two or three times. Now, as we go forward, this is going to make sense. Uh, you know, now let me uh, tell you guys about Middle Tennessee State University, and this is all going to tie in. It's going to make sense in just a minute. 
I went over to uh, MTSU and we, uh, we did a capture of the flag and we did it with the Department of Homeland Security. And when we did this, uh, all these folks were coming in and I was going around and I was talking to people and I, I was asking, where did you go to school? What do you do? Where are you at? A lot of people had CISSP shirts. They had certified ethical hacking shirts from EC Council, you know, and, and uh, you had some folks that said, I've been doing this for 20 years, whatever. What we had actually set up was four Windows servers that had a million vulnerabilities. We were sharing out folders that had very simplex passwords. Some of them had no passwords on it. We had Linux machines that were sitting over to the side that had open shares on them and some had vulnerabilities. And then we had some more hardened servers that went with that and we actually have flags in each one. How many of you guys have played Capture the Flag before? Anybody in here? Okay. I'm going to tell you the disastrous results and what I got to witness when I was in there. Uh, I thought we were in trouble because as I walked in and uh, I was waiting to speak, I was hearing people say, you know, I, I really don't know what I'm doing. Last night I stayed in a hotel room. I watched YouTube videos on Cali Linux, but I'm going to win this game. And I was going, this is not going to be good. All right, anyway, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you how far it went. Uh, during the uh, capture of the flag, and you'll see... DDoS and the switches and the servers. Now let me let me explain that. The 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 folks that had Linux and, and I'm a Linux guy by the way. I'm a Linux guy. I'm a Windows guy. I'm a Mac guy. But the guys that had Linux that had been using Linux for a long time, of course, they were checking for connectivity and they immediately scanned the network and they started pinging to see if they had connectivity. Well, what happened is, of course, in Linux, whenever you ping, it does a continuous ping. So uh, immediately you had like 100 people that started pinging the switches and pinging the servers, but they minimized those windows. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? <laughs> so the next thing you know is they open up another terminal and they start pinging to see if they have connectivity and they start pinging the switches, pinging the servers and trying to see if they had open ports. And I looked down there and, they, and you know, this one guy literally has 50 open windows and I go, dude, you're, you're like performing a DOS attack but what he did was he couldn't get an IP address when he originally started because he started a little bit late and everybody was kind of hitting the servers. And what took place was he asked his partner, what's your IP address? And when he started pinging over and over again, he thought that was one of the server's IP addresses and he was DOS attacking his, his buddy. <laughs> and his buddy had asked a guy next to him, what's your IP address, man? I think we're losing connectivity. And he started pinging him and he says, it's not working. And then before you know it, I've got 100 people with 50 windows open that are just pinging one another. <laughs> and I'm standing there going, and I'm looking at all the shirts, and I'm looking at what's going down. But anyway, they were DOS attacking themselves. They couldn't log on whenever I started giving the passwords. Once we had reached the hour and a half point, uh, one of the people I work with said, uh, he kind of nudges me, and he does work for the Department of Homeland Security, and he says, uh, hey man, just try to help him out a little bit. I said, okay, this server, the password's one, two, three, four. It's that simple. The server's name is this. Get in. The flag is under this folder. Nobody could get it. So we had to actually spin it around and say, okay, put a USB drive in it. We'll let you cut and copy it off of there and you can have a flag. True story. True story. Did, did anybody participate in that one? If, if you did, don't raise your hand. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. Uh, the, uh, there's my Cali Linux and the YouTube whenever they were they were going into and I, I'm not making fun of people I'm just saying this is what's happening with education today I think we actually learn more from one another in on our own than we are in a lot of colleges and I'm just being sincere but I'm going to tell you how we have structured ours not that we're right just like I said in just a minute uh, nobody even scanned the network until we told them hey if you scan the network you may be able to find us and then we were actually helping them with the tools. But anyway, nobody even used Nmap, which is a very simplex tool where you could go and at least find some of the ports that were open. Anyway, this is how we're set up. And like I said, we may not be right. You're with me 30 hours a week. When you walk into that school, you come in at 745, you leave at 215. Two hours a day, you actually spend lecturing, a consistent lecture that lasts 55 minutes or so. I give you a five minute break, we lecture again. You get 10 hours of lecture. Then you get 10 hours of lab a week. And you're helping one another. Remember the round robin that we talked about? The senior guys are helping the junior guys. And then as the senior guys graduate and they get jobs, then those junior guys become senior guys. And then they're helping each other. So they do this stuff over and over again. 
Then they have two hours of homework, study time, and they have projects. They go out to the community. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we actually won the uh, Harold Love Award, uh, which was out of the state uh, for volunteering, where we work with United Way and the police departments and the sheriff's department and just whatever nonprofits, and we would send our students out. And we would say, you're going to get real world hands on. You're not going to work with just labs. You're not going to work with emulators or simulators that are in the cloud. You're going to work with real stuff. And uh, when you look at this, the school network, you know, we've only got 1,200 nodes down there, but we also only have 40 students. With those 40 students and 1,200 nodes, we also have this thing called a student body. Well, the student body, they got iPods, iPads, Androids, laptops, netbooks, and people come in and they look like some kind of futuristic being whenever they open up their backpack. You don't know what's going down, right? It looks like a Best Buy has exploded. Anyway, so they take care of about 5,000 different nodes at our school. And as they, as they do this, I just believe every college, whether it's community college or whether it's a four-year university, they need to have that hands-on. Not, let's go do one lab, you know, is history, uh, is history science, and, and English, and that thing, is that important? It is important. But we're not teaching people's, uh, people computers fast enough. You know, what's going to happen when you get your four-year degree? What did you learn your first year? outdated technology or a lot of technology that's dated so what you're really learning in your junior and senior year is really what you're going to be doing or you hope to be doing but anyway with that said they had to process the work orders for the uh, students so they learn customer service the whole nine yards now there are student interns whenever you go out to these larger universities and they say you know we got 20 people who get to be student interns this term and then maybe next term but where the learning's really happening is back in the dorms where people are actually setting up and they're doing Linux or what have you. Anyway, and they need a better focus on hands-on. That two hour or three hour lab or even six hours of lab is just not enough during the course of a week. So we, we took off and we started doing really good because we were doing these labs and we were doing everything. And then we started having employers that were leaving uh, Atlanta and leaving Nashville and they were coming to Shelbyville, Tennessee, a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere and they were coming up saying, I want your people, which is really good for us. But when we, and, but this moves over to the workplace too. Today in the workplace, you know what they want? They want the new guy with the least amount of money with 20 years experience. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Yes. And the thing that we've lost is we've lost mentorships. When we go into a place because how busy it is now with mobile devices, the complexity of switches, the complexity of, of cloud computing and, and the servers and things that we have, and because most of us are understaffed, even when they say the new guy's with you, it becomes a, you know, it becomes that. When we should really be mentoring them and telling them everything. And there's a new thing in IT, whenever we look at people, you know, and they're new, you've got to remember you were that person at one time. And we're trying to get out and tell employers and tell IT people when the new guy's assigned to you, we're trying to tell the employers you're not going to get 20 years experience for 40 grand. You're not going to do it. And we also try to tell the people who work in IT, whenever we go around and we speak, be patient with people. You know, just because you know PHP or, or you're doing .NET or, or whether you're spinning up a VM, that we need to stop and train those people. But anyway, let me go forward, I'm sorry. But the other thing that we need to do, moving into the security side of it, because everything is focused on security now, is we need to expose students to hacking tools. Now, several years ago, about seven, eight years ago, I looked at my boss and I said, hey, uh, we're going to run Wireshark on the network. He goes, okay, sounds good. And I'm going to let students do that too. And he goes, yeah, it sounds good. And I went, man, I've really got to tell him, you know, what Wireshark is. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I went back in there and I said, all right, now we're going to do a control network. And he goes, control network? And then you see the, you know, and I go, and the reason being is Wireshark can not only examine packets of data and protocols and and this kind of thing, you can kind of like capture passwords. And he's going, yeah, it's a, 
I mean, many can capture passwords. And I go, well, it's going to be in a controlled environment. And, you know, we're going to work with students. And we're going to get a liability for them. And, and we need to show students how to use hacking tools. And I don't know why my boss says, uh, you know, I was reading that this university got broke into and this and this and this. And, yeah, it sounds like a good deal. And, said, and we're going to run a little MMAP, too. And he goes, yeah, it sounds good. And so, and some Nessus. How about some Folk and some Zap? And he goes, whatever you want to do. All right. And I said, let me, let me email you what these things do, man, because let's make sure we're, we're good because it's going to be in a controlled environment. So anyway, here's the biggest thing. The reason we need to teach people about hacking, and, and the hacking goes far outside of, um, of um, how to break in or, or how to exploit software or, or find the vulnerabilities in a server. It, it, it also gets into letting those students experiment just like all through Freaknik where you see different things and you know if a student says hey I've got an Arduino or I've got a Raspberry Pi and I'm like bring it in just mess with it you know in that two hours in the afternoon when they're doing homework and helping one another we let them do that so they can learn but anyway they need to understand malicious software uh, hacking software and they need to understand about you know um, the different things in security but with that, I mean, just some of the tools, and of course, these are very basic tools. There's a million tools that are out there. I mean, now my boss says, hey, you want to run Kali Linux? That's great. We tell them what it does. We kind of give them a breakdown. We try to keep it controlled. And, and, and then one day he comes to me and he says, wait a minute, we've got them signing forms, but how do we trust them? And I said, here's the deal. Whatever we're teaching them now, and they've signed the form, they can learn on YouTube anyway. They can do everything from lockpick to Kali Linux to how to break into a car. And, um, you know, that's just some of the things that we do, you know, in our organization. But it needs to spread nationwide. We're always hearing about how there's a lack of security analysts that are out there. Uh, why there's such a need for a security analyst? Well, we better start mentorships and community colleges and universities. I'm not talking about going in and having a little seminar just like this and you know I come up and I, I, I show you how to do Wireshark or how to run a uh, zap or something like that those things are good and, and it's great to hear from experts a lot of experts here at Freaknik especially over at Black Hat you know over in Las Vegas annually and all the different things that happen throughout the United States but we better start teaching as a formalized uh, or a part, as a part of formalized education because we're going to lose America's infrastructure. And if something's going to happen where we have uh, some kind of, 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 where we have a power grid go down, or we have a water system that becomes contaminated, or we're going to have something in manufacturing, or we're going to have even more, uh, uh, more of a loss of data. And, you know, if you look at statistics and you go up to the Identity Theft Resource Center, if, if do me a favor, from here, over, stand up, just for a second. Everybody from here over, stand up. Right there, stop where you're at, about right there. Your identity's gone already. Come on, sit down. Your identity's gone. It's just that the hackers have chosen not to use it. Think about it. We live in America, we live in a place of complacency. And you go, wait a minute, what do you mean complacency? I care. You know, we can complain about people violating our rights, but we can go to Facebook and we can like every article that's up there and click on every virus known to mankind, right or wrong. Right. We don't, you know, we're, we've reached a point that we care about security, we care about privacy, but we're not really doing anything as far as formalized education to really train people. And we're, we're consumers. You know, I'll guarantee you, everybody in this crowd probably has heard, you know, you need a VPN anytime you connect to any type of wireless that's open wireless. And as I walk around, people are just logging into the old uh, hotel wireless left and right. I'm over at Starbucks and, you know, I see people just logging on, trucking right along. Are you following me? We, but anyway, so we, we show all these different things. We show students how to use SAP, FOCA, MMAT, Wireshark, uh, all various different types of network scanners. But we don't do it in just Windows because we figured out real quick and fast 
that even though Windows runs 90 something percent of the market, that share for Linux being in the enterprise, getting into a data center and getting your more complex jobs was going to be very important for somebody that was going to be in security or networking. So, you know, what do we need to expose our students to? Or, or and you can substitute, substitute that with what do we need to substitute our new employees that are in the IT department? They need to understand group policies, hardening, software, switches, spectrum analyzers for wireless. Um, they need to understand those very basic hacking tools such as Wireshark because a lot of times, uh, and I'm gonna say Wireshark probably a dozen times, but when they see Wireshark and they see how it can capture a password and how easy it is, or if you use Kane and Able and show them how easy it is to poison, you know, somebody DNS or ARC poison them and send them where you want them to go, and it, that really wakes people up. I mean, this, this is our school, but if you look at it, those little colors that you see around it, that's a uh, student's KML file that he produced for Google Earth. But we need to do that in every school. And we need to start early where, you know, this is just an example where we cooperate with law enforcement. We tell them, hey man, we're gonna do war walking. Students are gonna be using something like this Tumblr. They're gonna be using GPSs. They're gonna be mapping out um, uh, wireless so that they can see uh, where the isotropic radiator is so that they can have an understanding whenever they're using security, why WPA2 AES is not good enough. You know, you better make sure uh, that you got a radius server there and you better have IDS and IPS systems that are in place. But we're not doing that. Go through and look at a typical college curriculum and you go through it and it says, learn Java. So you commit an entire, you know, two semesters or, or three credit hours of learning just Java. That's a good thing. But you got Java, ASP, I mean, you can just go through those like a million miles an hour. But, you know, if we're gonna teach Java, we better teach Java security. If we're gonna teach uh, .NET, we better teach .NET security. If we're gonna teach SQL, we love to teach databases in colleges. This is how to make a database, this is what a table is. You know, these are fields and these are the individual sides of the field and this is Microsoft SQL and this is my SQL, and we're gonna go through. But do we go through and say, hey, this is an um, SQL injection and this is what can take place and this is how data is stolen? You know, are we going to our people who write applications? And then, you know, we usually touch this much on application security and this much on how to develop an application. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the things that we did is, is as we're doing this, we go, hey man, we need to teach PLCs. So we have an industrial maintenance class. I went down there and I said, hey, I need an Omron touchscreen. And they go, for what? You teach computers. I said, exactly. You're all using the old one in the corner. You can have it if you can get it going. Hey man, there's YouTube. I got it going, right? So, you know, of course, I'm going to show you, you know, just an example of how you should teach folks. And as primitive as this is and simplex as we make it here, of course, there's a thousand other ways. But, you know, we just teach them because they're all Windows based. 99% of the kids growing up, they're Windows based or what have you. And then you say, hey, this is all perfect network scanner. And we're going to scan these IP addresses when you scan them. Look these MAC addresses up, find the MAC address. What do you see? What goes to Omron? What is Omron? Omron's PLC, it's SCADA devices, it's touchscreen, it's using manufacturing, it's using healthcare, the whole nine yards. So once they see that and they begin to learn it, you go over, and of course you guys can't see the screen because I put this PowerPoint together in about 10 minutes in the car. I was going, oh, man, I really didn't prepare for this. But anyway, and then, then you run MMAP, and then you're saying, hey, you know, I want you to run MMAP. And having the cooperation of people who are in charge, now listen to me, not just in education where I go to my director, so I say I'm going to teach this in college, but also what, you should have these labs set up in your organization, whether you're in a small uh, business or whether you're, uh, excuse me, a medium-sized business or whether you're in an enterprise so that you can train people. We need to bring that back. So when we look at this, there's MMAP, we run MMAP. We go over and we find out, basically you see port number 3389 is open. 3389 is remote desktop, therefore it must be Windows. That's how my kids think. So then you'll see the kids, they open a remote desktop, they immediately try to log in because they went over and they've researched what the default passwords are and they find out it fails. But then you teach them, you know, but you also train them on Linux. 
because you train them on Linux a little bit, they're going to see things like Telnet D down here. And when they see Telnet D, you'll have that one kid who will have a spark and he says, Telnet's port number 23. So then you'll see them try to Telnet into it. And when they try to Telnet into it, what will take place is it's going to fail. And they go, why did it fail? Well, if you look, it's 3389. Basically, what online did is they changed uh, Telnet's port number. You can Telnet in, go to the IP address, and put the port number in. And, of course, this, this just shows the OS where they find out that it is Linux. And, of course, the research of just finding the default passwords, and you can find out, or you can tell them how people who put things in infrastructure, if they skip something, or in manufacturing, or even in a hospital environment where you have SCADA, if they're not doing the correct thing, then you're going to have a loss of data, or you're going to have equipment that's going to be damaged. So as we go forward, you go, I mean, you can't see that, but it, uh, basically all we're doing is we're telnetting in, and then it's going to, uh, and we teach them, of course, they, they learn how to navigate terminal inside of Linux, and they're going to type in LS, and they're going to see that SCADA device, and they're going to see the directory for that SCADA device. And then immediately, you've always got that one guy that's pretty smart, and he goes, hey, man, let's just kill all the services, and we'll shut it down. And you're going, hang on. This is not killing yet. But then I started thinking about it. He's right. Let's hook a motor up to this touchscreen. Let's get this motor where it's running. Let's let him kill those services so he can see how motors can be shut off. We need to let people experiment in the enterprise and in colleges. Every college. It's not just the MITs or the Caltechs, just like I said. But, you know, everybody usually sees this and they say, oh, you just train on Windows. Uh, because you guys are a small technical college. No, we don't. You know, we're doing Linux tails and we're doing more advanced uh, versions of Linux, but we also do Macs because in the enterprise you have to train on all of that. And this is an example whenever we go over and we're using Linux to do the exact same thing, but we want to take it another step and we ask them to look for the hashes in there so they can gather all the passwords. And of course, we tell them, you know, uh, we're running Hashcat so that we can uh, find the information. And then as it goes through, they can find all the different, all the different users that's in that SCADA device. And then of course, we allow them to go through and we allow them to upload malware to the device. But it's fake malware, of course. You know, we tell them to make a text file, we check it before they do it. Senior students check them. We make sure that they can do it. But where does that go? Okay, we teach them the bad side of that. If they know the bad side of it, they're going to know the good side of it, and we take them over to the good side so they can start locking things down. And, you know, those are just basic examples because it does cover infrastructure, manufacturing, health care, businesses, and it also covers themselves if they're going to protect their own identity. You know, the, the, the biggest thing about learning today is um, with social media, we now have this attention span, including myself, where I've added these extra things into my life. You know, I don't even know how to survive without Facebook. I'm 400 years old and I was like, you know, now I've got like 5,000 friends of which two of them will help me move if I really needed a friend, right? <laughs> And uh, so when we're teaching students and they get into a 45 minute to a one hour lecture, if we teach them just the theory behind that and then they have a 20 minute hands on or some kind of exercise they take home and they're gonna run some kind of little software. Back in my day, we did the little hello world and we were so happy to see it when we went hello world. And it was a programming language that is so primitive today it's just unreal but if we back up in time and we look at what we were doing we had people that were very patient that were that was teaching us so how many of you guys actually work in IT right now how many guys majority of you folks do okay now if you work in IT what I'm going to ask you guys to do is when the new kid get on the block gets there, I had this habit. 
instead of looking at the new guy that's working in IT and saying how bad he stinks. That's not body smell. His skills is to mentor them and to show them and to be patient. I, how many of you guys have been to a seminar and when you get to the seminar you think, why did I waste my money doing this? I had more fun at the pool last night hanging out, right? If you can, if you can actually be patient and train people with those hands-on skills and train them in security as you do that and why don't be intimidated in today's world we're intimidated and that, a lot of that's due to the recession and the way the job market is or what have you and like i was saying earlier mike rowe of dirty jobs supports technical education there's 3.2 million jobs that are available today but we don't have people that have the skills that can do it so whenever we're looking at uh training these folks and going to seminars, make sure the seminars provide you with hands-on. Make sure that when you do training, make sure you have hands-on. Now, of course, you're gonna have that soft, fluffy stuff that you have to do every year from sexual harassment to avoiding phishing emails, being safe on the internet, that kind of thing for the office people. <clears throat> but when you do training for uh, uh, people in your organization, don't be scared and intimidated because most people are afraid to train people because they fear for their jobs. That's my opinion. It's a form of intimidation. I'm not gonna train them too much because it's dog eat dog. But what we need to do is we need to do that because you saw the people that were standing up in here, nine out of 10 people that have already lost their identity because of complacency, lack of security. You know, we had a retailer who actually left their uh, HVAC unit, their SCADA system with the default passwords. We've had a retailer system that threw a wireless up on a Friday afternoon that left it open on a secured network. All you have to do is just read these cases after case after case. Education isn't just about how colleges should begin to train. Education is also in that workplace. And of course, with colleges from two to four year universities, if they don't train, or excuse me, if they don't change their methods of training, we are going to have a skills gap and companies are going to suffer for it. They're already suffering for it. And, um, you know, uh, I have my students all the time. They go, what program of language, languages do you know? And I go, do you want to start with Fortran or COBOL? And they stare at me really weird. And then I go, well, let's go on up to .NET. And let's get some of this modern stuff knocked out of the way. Ruby on Rails, PHP, you know, whatever. And, um, and then they'll say, hey, teach me whatever. And I'll take that time out to do that. And uh, if you work in IT, guys, stop and train those new guys. If you're not in IT, a lot of you guys may come from businesses or you may be associated with security and you want to know uh, a little bit about what's happening at Freaknik and you go around and you see these kids next door and you see drones and lock picking and Legos and all this stuff. And here's the thing, remember what I was saying about social media? We need to teach people how to analytically think again without Google. But whoever invented Google, I know the dude. I mean, I don't know the dude, but I'm so happy. But that's another story. But training starts with hands-on. And with security, you've got to have the positives and the negatives. Uh, what we uh, recently decided that we would do is we would introduce real viruses into that network not our school network, so don't let me be misquoted into control network. And you would think, why are you introducing real viruses into the network? Anybody? You gotta know how to remove them. You gotta know how to remove them. Now imagine going to a four-year university and go, we got this virus, we're gonna stick it over here on the network, and uh, we're gonna take it back off. What do you think they would say? 99% of them would say no. Am I right or wrong? Or if you say, we're going to walk around to school. All right, listen, I had to make a purchase for a pineapple. Who knows what a pineapple is? I put a requisition in for a pineapple, okay? And uh, I kind of just threw it up there. Hey, it's Mark 5 pineapple. It's made by Hack 5. I want to have that. I got the money in my budget. I'll see you later. Bye. You know, that doesn't work. They're like, what's a pineapple? And you're like, well, you don't eat it, but it kind of eats passwords and, you know, can do other things. And then they were like, uh, 
Um, when does this end? And I said, when technology ends and it's going faster and faster. We have to turn out students, like I said, in a one year to 15 month period. That's why we do 30 hours a week. And here's what we tell our recruiters whenever they call. When they put those skills down on their resumes, they've done the hands-on, not necessarily in an enterprise, they have done it in a controlled environment and not just a miniature lab, they've done it on a lab that's really big. When I say really big, you're talking about, not really big, but it's really big for a school lab where you've got uh, over 200 computers with domains or what have you that we introduced, which is called our hacking lab. So they can go in and destroy stuff, so they can fix stuff, so they can know how to protect it, right? And uh, when these recruiters call, we have to show them or tell them that they do know how to make a database, but they can also prevent an SQL injection. And what I recommend is whatever your specialty is, if you're in IT, is to is to actually actually ask that ask the uh, folks that you work with or ask yourself, do I know how to protect what I currently do? If you're the uh, guy that's in networking and you do all uh, brocade switches or HP switches, what have you, do you know how to protect them? Not just get a firmware update or whatever. Do you know how to protect them? If you're the SQL guy, do you know how to protect that SQL server? But we better, think, we better change the way that we're thinking about education. And that's in the workplace and we better be talking about security in the workplace and we better be changing it at the higher education level. But anyway, guys, that's all I've got. And I know I'm pretty much up here and it sounds like I'm venting. But when you go out into your workplace, help those new guys. And don't expect the, um, the new guy to have 20 to 30 years experience. That's all I got.